Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Congregation Yeshua's Torah Studies. And this week's Torah portion is called Bo, or in English, Come. And if you're new to the channel, we are a Messianic congregation based in Mississauga, Ontario. So for more details, please uh, send us an email or send us a text. And if you are interested to know why we need to go back to our Jewish calling, is uh, please order this book. Uh, again, uh, if you're interested to get this book, uh, if you live in Canada, we have an, a limited number in our library that we can ship to you. So for a quick summary, if you're following the Torah portion, it's taken from Exodus chapter 10 verse 1 to chapter 13 verse 16. There's a lot of insights. I have two hours of materials or more, but uh, we don't have that much time. So I'm going to be talking very fast and we're going to go over some of the insights in again looking at the patterns looking at spiritual patterns how that patterns will affect us today so partial uh, the part of exodus is ironically titled come to pharaoh so they're leaving exodus means they're, they're they're leaving egypt but yet god is calling moses to come to pharaoh we're going to look at uh, the insights on that one the purpose of redemption we need to understand that uh, uh, did god just save us that's it that's the you know that's the ultimate uh, end goal and we're going to look at the purpose of redemption. We look at the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, the insights on the purpose of miracles, and uh, the, the Pesach connection to Abraham. We're going to look at the connection and the plague of the death of the firstborn, the, the, the tenth plague. And Hashem changes the year, the new year for his people. And we're going to look at the insights on why um, uh, the new year was changed, Yeshua's connection to the Pesach, of course. Uh, we're going to learn more about that when we go into the peace of uh, or the feast of or the uh, Passover Seder, which will be coming soon in the next few months. So and then we're going to look at insights on the mixed multitudes and we look at patterns again. Look, we're interested in looking at spiritual patterns and how this can affect us. So. Um, the, the Torah portion starts us out, The Lord said to Moses, Go or come to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. So here the Hebrew word there is hardened, and, and uh, it's correctly translated in English. And we're going to see, you know, did God try to subvert the will of uh, Pharaoh here? And also the hearts of the servants. Look at verse 2, And thou may tell to the ear. So the next few, the, the first seven plagues, remember, the, 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 the plague of hail last week, we saw that Pharaoh was finally convinced uh, and finally began to know that the, the God of Israel, the, the one true living God. So if you look at closely, remember the plague, the seventh plague, Pharaoh was educated already about the one true God, yet Pharaoh seemed not convinced. There's still a problem. There is still this pride. Pharaoh still had this pride and could not accept the fact that he is not a God, in quotes. So God will be speaking to him and challenges Pharaoh's ego. And God knows that Pharaoh has an ego problem. And the next few plagues, you'll see here, verse 2, the purpose of the next few plagues is what? So that it's for the children of Israel, that they may tell the ears of thy son and thy son's son what I have wrought upon Egypt my signs which I have done which I have done among them that they may know that I am the Lord. So now the the plagues now um, is going to be about a witness to the people of Israel, the Jewish people. Um, and Moses and Aaron went um, went to Pharaoh as he said and the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself? So there it is. So God is addressing Pharaoh's pride. So there's some interesting insights here um, because, like I said, the Torah portion is, is, is about the story of the Exodus. And yet, God is telling Moses to come to Pharaoh. So, so, so the opening line, bow or come to Pharaoh, if we are leaving Egypt, then why is the Parsha calling us to come to Pharaoh? It seems to put uh, Pharaoh in an ultimate power seat. So some interesting insights from the Soar, this is the mystic uh, uh, part of the, of the Jewish religion. 
Perzor's interpretation, this means come with me to Pharaoh. In other words, God is saying to Moses, listen, you are not going to defeat evil. Uh, Pharaoh's uh, you, uh, you are not going to defeat evil. Pharaoh represents the embodiment or the incarnation of evil. Uh, it represents carnality, all materialism, spiritual bondage. Uh, you are not going to do it on your own. Why? Because salvation can be found in no man. That is why the Mashiach had to come down from heaven. He could not just be a man. If he's just a man, then Moses could not have done it. Then Moses could have done it. Perhaps Adam also could have done it. That is why Hashem said, "Come with me to Pharaoh." This was the big. The, this was the, this was because in the beginning it says on the eighth plague, God set out to break Pharaoh himself to destroy his power at its core and exodus was the release from the oppressing and oppression brought about by the world or representing uh, satan and his uh, kingdom of darkness uh, an order to uh, to a, a lifestyle that is dedicated uh, to evil and god is calling them out of that so in Exodus chapter 10, as you said, the Lord comes, told Moses to come. Pharaoh, mirac the, the miraculous signs are a sign that Hashem, the master of creation, which is in our day and age, having, having read no, the Bible, is no brainer, of course, because we know the story. We know what happens. We know the ending. We know the beginning and the ending. But then the people didn't have the Bible then. They only had the oral Torah at, 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 at Moses' time. There was no such thing as written Torah. It was not yet given to them. They were getting the Torah as it is playing out. So the people did not realize or know Hashem or God as they worship many gods. Remember that uh, everybody was an idolater, the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people. He was... And they need to learn who is the master of the universe, the master of creation. They taught that Mother Earth, they were taught about Father Earth, and they would play out in its own by evolution. And they did not realize that Hashem, the God of the universe, is, con is in control. So again, Bo is, means come. Interesting that the Parsha again of Exodus meaning the story where the Jews are finally leaving Egypt is called Bo or Come. One would never think that the Parsha of Exodus would be called Bo. Instead, it is called, it is said Come. So that the underlying meaning is that the Exodus has a result. In other words, it has a destination. Who the sun sets free, it says in scripture, is free indeed. Many people think that salvation is all about freedom, period. That's the end of the story. They don't understand that salvation is about freedom that leads somewhere. God set us free. Remember, they were under demonic powers. And God is setting them free. But God is not setting them free so that they can do whatever they want. You see, you see here, as we will learn... The, the, in order for them, you know, salvation is about freedom that leads somewhere, such as of servants. You know, God is bringing us to his kingdom. So the Parsha of Exodus is known as the Parsha uh, of, to come. We are leaving in order to come. Okay, we understand that we are saved so that we could come where? We could come to God. So it's saying, I left the spiritual bondage so I could come to God freely but many don't realize that freedom does not mean that you are free to do whatever you want whatever is right in your own eyes we went from an evil master that has a that has bound us and enslave us to come to a loving God and so that we can serve love him and serve him in return wow so uh, here you see here that Pharaoh uh, that uh, Moses didn't even wait for, for Pharaoh's answer. He turned and went to Pharaoh. And finally, now, verse 7, look at this. Pharaoh's servants are beginning to turn on him and said, How long will, you, will this man snare us? Let them go that they may serve the Lord their God. So uh, uh, 
or or or, or yet the e Egypt will be destroyed. Verse seven. Verse eight. And Moses and Aaron were brought again into Pharaoh's presence, and he said, "Go serve God, your God." But who are going with you? In verse nine. Moses said, "We will go with our young, and our old, and our and, and our sons, and our daughters, our flocks." Verse ten. And he said to them. So be the Lord with so be the Lord with you as I will let you go. Your little ones see that evil is before your, their face. So in other words, um, again, Pharaoh is trying to negotiate with God. Okay, I'm okay. I'm gonna serve you. You know, Pharaoh is saying, you know, um, who is going? And he and he begins to he begins to. To uh, negotiate with God again, you know, that sometimes uh, we do that also in our lives, right? You know, we said, "Oh God, I'm going to serve you," but you know, um, you know, I, I like, I like, I like my lifestyle. I, I can't get, uh, get rid of my lifestyle. So Moses did not even wait. He says it for a response from Pharaoh and left. Pharaoh's own leaders are asking him, "Pharaoh, how long will will this be a snare for us?" Um, even his own advisors now are starting to turn against Pharaoh, saying, listen, let these people go. Egypt has lost. The battle is over. The advisors are calling back Moses and Aaron. We find Pharaoh again negotiating with God. Again, we find ourselves doing the same thing. Okay, God, I will serve you. But these are my conditions for serving you. I will serve you, but I really like my lifestyle. I really like my diet. Man has been trying to negotiate with God to create our, their own religion that works for them or for us. And that is what exactly Pharaoh was doing here. He is telling God if he is, he does not, he is telling God if he does not know, Moses already said, let my people go, not some of them, but all of them. So, so here you see here how uh, we have been doing the same for God. So here's some insight because remember, as I said earlier, you know, uh, God has set us free. Pesach, uh, Passover is the uh, Exodus is all about the redemption, setting us free. Most people would realize that, that the Exodus from Egypt ultimately, at least allegorically or uh, in a spiritual, is a spiritual Exodus. That is what it is saying here. The Exodus was a release from the, of the, uh, the from the op oppressing and the bondage of Egypt or the world, which is materialism, self-indulgence, false religion, false deities. It was a deliverance from what a lifestyle. But there, but but here is why. Remember, we often forget the way. We do what we do for one self, for one self-indulgent lifestyle in in order to live a lifestyle dedicated to God. So let me repeat that. Sorry, I was uh, misreading my notes. So what, what he's saying is, God is taking us from from bondage into what? Into a lifestyle that is dedicated to God because that is our purpose. What is the Exodus, what was the Exodus? It was a release from bondage, oppression, from 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 uh, self-indulgent lifestyle. And why? The why is in order for us to live a, a life dedicated to God's God's kingdom. That is why. That is the most important thing of all. The what, 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 why, and the what. We are set free spiritually great. How did that happen? By God's mighty hand and his outstretched arm. But the most important thing is why did he, why did it happen? And why is it that we have been why is why is it that he did it for us? Why? So that we so that we can serve him. We can dedicate our life to his service. That is the point where many of us miss. Most people know that know what happened, how it happened, but most people miss the point as to why and for what purpose. The Exodus represents spiritual freedom. We went from Exodus right where to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. So here is the pattern. The Exodus is about spiritual freedom. We left Egypt. And where did we go? The chains were broken. God opened the door and God said, well, the blood of the Lamb, you you had faith. Now, go to the desert, go to the promised land. Remember, the promised land was 
northeast. And when they left Egypt, they went south. Uh, they went. They went south. They went to Arabia, to Mount Sinai. They didn't go directly to the promised land. Why? Because God took them right to Mount Sinai. For what purpose? What is the reason for God sending them there? Think about it. They were closer. If you think about, if you look at the map where they were, they were only a few days or possibly a few, maybe a week or so to the promised land. But God diverted them. They, they, God sent them where? He went. Them, sent them to Mount Sinai to get what? To get the Torah. So therefore, in God's eyes, Torah equals spiritual freedom. The Exodus equals spiritual freedom. And so Torah equals spiritual freedom. The, ox, the Exodus happened during Pesach. The receiving of the Torah happened during Shavuot. These two festivals or these feasts are connected. In fact, Pesach is just the beginning of the, of the end, which is Shavuot. In other words, Shavuot is the end of Exodus. According to Jewish thought, biblical thought, the end of Pesach is Shavuot. In short, from spiritual freedom to spiritual purpose, serving God to His Torah. So here's some more insights here, um, again from their um, ancient writer, Rome Bell. Shabbat is the point, is really the point of Exodus. You can see the pattern here. You see, you could almost say that the Shabbat or Pentecost is that which points or which the Exodus points to. There is a, this is a misquoted, misunderstood line in the letters of Paul that the Messiah is the end of the law. And that he has understood it is, is very, that understanding is very blasphemous. It's a very heretical way for centuries to mean that the Messiah was, was the point at which the law, that is the scripture, the word of God, God's holy word, God's infallible word, came to an end. Of course not. That's not, the, the, you know, we, we know that, that that's not true. Um, there, the, the, the end, the, that means there's, the, the, that the thing means that that thing to which it points. So the Torah ultimately points to Messiah. And the, the Messiah is the Torah. So in fact, the Torah is pointing to itself. So here we have Pesach pointing to Shavuot or to Pentecost saying, this is the end. That this is the end, not this. This is the end, not this end is is connected by by the counting of the omer remember which is 50 days um from um from pesach uh, therefore pesach is connected to shavuot shavuot is 50th day that is why it's called pentecost the 50th day the counting of the omer 50 equals jubilee therefore shavuot is all about spiritual freedom which means therefore the reality of life and people me will 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 uh, will will be surprised if you are not living a Torah life, you are actually according to the Word of God living in spiritual bondage. The reason you can say that is there's only there's only two kingdoms. It's either you are of the kingdom of light or of the kingdom of darkness. In God's word, you need, the, the the kingdom of light, of course, is God's word, His covenant, His Torah, His law, and anything outside of that is the kingdom of darkness. No matter what it is, why? Because there is no third option. That is why Yeshua said, "Is He said, it's either you're for me or against me. There is no middle. There is no third option. You are either hot or you are cold." In Acts chapter 1, remember when before Yeshua ascended, he said after his death, he showed himself, verse uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 3, and gave many convincing proof that he was alive. During the, the period of 40 days, they saw him and he spoke with him about the kingdom of God. And one of these gatherings, he instructed them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what? The Father promised, which you have heard about me, for Yohanan. John immersed you with water, but in the few days you will be immersed with the Roha Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. When they were, when they were together, they asked him, "Lord, are you about to? When are you going? What's the time you're going to restore Israel?" And answered, "You don't need dates, but verse eight. But you shall receive power when 
the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Yerushalayim, in Judea, and in Samaria, in, in the outermost ends of the earth. What is the Great Commission? A lot of people don't understand the Great Commission. The Great Commission, he said, make Talmidin, make disciples, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make people from all nations into a disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is someone who obeys what the master has done or is doing, right? We, we, we copy, we copy. Who is our, who is our, who do we copy? We copy Yeshua. He said, immersing them in the reality of the Father, the Son, and the Ruach of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. Say, say that, obey everything that I have commanded you. See, there is a way, there's a way of life. You know, it's not what is pleasing in our sight. So from, from Pesach, from freedom, He gave us purpose. Holy Spirit giving the same day, same same feast, the feast of Pentecost where, again, the spiritual pattern. What's the pattern? Yeshua said, wait in Jerusalem. Yeshua is telling the disciples that their purpose, why they save us, to set us, set us, set us free to obey His commandments and His great commission. So the play number eight, as you know, the loco, locusts send winds. Again, they it's addressing the god of the winds. The, you know, they had they 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 worship the god of storm, darkness, and disorder. So the plague of uh, locusts, like I said, then uh, uh, what's interesting about the plague of locusts is they said that uh, well. Of course, it did not affect the children of Israel. And here we see here that uh, God strengthened, not hardened, strengthened Pharaoh's heart. So the plague of darkness, uh, so uh, in, uh, in, um, in verse, uh, I guess that's chapter 10, verse 20, but the Lord kasak or strengthened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the children of Israel go. And the Lord stretched forth his hand, and what happened? There was darkness. There was darkness. Uh, they ref he refused to let the animals go. He said, you can go, but leave your animal. Uh, there's some insights uh, about the, the plague of darkness. Um, uh, there's a famous rabbi, Rabbi Monk, comments, uh, or Rashi quotes, the Bin Rashi interpretation, that the darkness was, was so thick that it had such substance, and they could even touch it. They said that the atmosphere was, was filled with extremely thick layer of cloud in which many may, may, may uh, tried to light, uh, but was automatically extinguished. Even if you tried to light a fire, it will not light. Uh, in the Apocrypha, the book of Solomon, uh, the book of uh, Solomon describes the torment, anguish, and, and danger brought on by the plague of darkness, which spread gloom gloomy nights over Egypt while the Israelites were basking in dazzling lights. So Israel had light in their dwelling place. Uh, another rabbi's insight, Rabbi Nachman, yeah, brings down that the darkness was, was, very, was the very same darkness that originated from Gehenna or hell, that the nature of the darkness was the absence of light, which is why it was so terrible but for Israel, Israel, there was light in Goshen. There was light. They said not just in their dwelling. They just bring out that there was light wherever they went. We are the embassy of heaven wherever we go. Remember what I said last week. You know, yeah, this uh, where we are is where heaven stands because we are the ambassador. The, the, uh, if you if you have faith to believe that. The, the things of this earth, it does not affect you. COVID-19 does not have power over your life, over your household, over where you are standing. So if you're standing in your home, declare that this is the, the territory of heaven. This is, hash, uh, this is uh, heaven's territory. No weapon, no sickness lives in God's kingdom. There's only, there's only health and wealth in God's kingdom. Amen? There's no corruption, there's no pain, there's no sickness, no disease. So uh, we're going to look at some uh, 
um, insights on miracles, miracles, because miracles by themselves, uh, we, we ask, why do we need miracles to begin with, right? We, we, you know, often we, we don't realize it, but every day, you know, uh, we, you know, when the sun, uh, when we see the sun um, seemingly rising into our atmosphere, well, the sun is not rising, we are spinning. The fact that we are able to, to spin, the, you know, the, the earth is spinning in a, in a uh, axis where, you know, there is no strings, there is no road, it just spins in space according to how God instructed it to spin. That's in itself a miracle, and yet we, we see it every day. Why? Because it, it seems like natural. There's nothing natural about that. There's nothing that holds the earth from flying off its rotation. There's nothing that, there's no string, there's no pathway, there's no, there's no set pathway. It's only by the command of God. God set the orbit and it was established. And it's, it's, it's been it's spinning for thousands of years. And yet we, we, we see that and we say, it looks natural, but it's not, not supernatural. But miracles begin with, uh, would the, the, the question is, would Israel accept the Torah at Mount Sinai if they had not experienced the extraordinary miracles of Egypt? The reason why I bring it up is because many uh, Jews today that are anti-Yeshua said that, you know, miracles don't matter. Um, one of their arguments is that they completely dismiss miracles as they are not even necessary because one has the obvious argument against it because of Yeshua, Yeshua's miracles, his miracles. Miracles were well recorded, not just in the New Testament, but also in their Jewish writings. It is well-known fact. So, do, so, so, uh, so miracles... Uh, Today, so modern day anti-missionary or, you know, the people don't believe, the Jews that don't believe in Messiah, their attitude is, oh, oh Jews don't need miracles. They don't care about it. Uh, on one hand, they are right because the Torah teaches in, the, in Deuteronomy chapter 13, even if someone comes along and there are, they are raising the dead. This is what people who believe in, in Messiah need to hear. If you have somebody come along doing great miracles, raising the dead, opening deaf ears, healing blindness, walking on water, all those kinds of miracles. But the so-called prophet or would-be Messiah is telling you, leading you away from God, such as the Torah. In other words, you are they are doing great miracles and saying to you, uh, you don't have to to follow the Ten Commandments. You, you, you can eat pork. You, you, you can forget about celebrating the feast. You can, you know, you forget about Sabbaths. You, you can worship God on Sunday. Go, uh, uh, God's word, God's word says this person is a liar. He's a heretic. He's a false prophet. He's a deceiver. So in one sense, the Jews are correct. Miracles doesn't matter. But the miracles make a difference uh, uh, because Yeshua performed miracles, but he never told his disciples to stop obeying the Torah. That's why, remember when they brought him before the Sanhedrin, before the, uh, the, the high priest, they never accused him of, by saying that he told people not to follow the Torah of Moses or the Torah of God. They, ne they never accused him of that. What did they accuse him of? He accused him of claiming to be the Son of God. So miracles make a difference. This is a Jewish idea, as it were in their, in their writings, in their Midrash. It says, would the Israelites accept the Torah at Mount Sinai if they had not experienced the extraordinary miracles? That's the question. And it says here, it's possible they would not have as evidence from the very first words of the Ten Commandments where God presents himself to the people as, as the one who brought them out of Egypt. In other words, as God was about to give them the Torah, he introduces the idea, all that 
all that by saying, you saw the miracles that I did in Egypt. In other words, God himself says, my miracles were proof that I am the creator. I am the one. So he, this confirms that the Exodus was the foundation. What is the Exodus? The Exodus is miracles. You could replace in a sentence the word Exodus with the word miracles. This confirms that miracles were the foundation in him. Or the Exodus was the foundation of their belief in Hashem, the, God, the one true living God. So that miracles were very important, but it was coupled with the message. That is why so many people are led by the Spirit. They say the Spirit is leading us to break the Torah. They say the Spirit is leading us uh, to not follow the Word of God. Why? Because they will do things that is right in their own eyes. They are being led by a, a Spirit but it's not the Spirit of God, not the, the Holy Spirit. We can say that. Why? Because there is, God is not double-minded. God will not, God is not confused. God doesn't have multiple personalities. He doesn't say one thing and then to, and, and, and does another. He's not the father of lies. He's not the one who says, do what I say, not do what as I do. These words call to mind the words ending the, the words ending that you may know through the plagues in Egypt that I am Hashem. He's, he's remained the supreme, the, reminded them, remain the supreme goal of the divine act in Egypt. That what was the supreme goal? So that the, they would know God. Ultimately, the salvation of humanity would depend on our real, realization of, the, of this purpose. Sadly, today, many people have forgotten or forgotten the God of Israel. So uh, the, uh, the Passover, what's interesting, um, we're going to be uh, praying that we will have a Seder this year. Um, and in the Passover story, it's interesting that Abraham uh, is the focus. Uh, there was, uh, and the, 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 the retelling of the story of the Passover Seder um, the Abraham's name is mentioned predominantly. Why? What's the, what's the Abraham connection? The Abraham connection. Why did Abraham go to Egypt? Why? Because of the famine in the land. Uh, Genesis chapter 12. Why did Jacob end up in Egypt? Why? Genesis chapter 47. Because there was famine in the land. Again, so uh, Abraham and his family were, were idol worshippers. And God called them out of there. And we learn today, or we've been learning that almost all the people that were in Egypt, they were also idol worshippers. That's why everyone had to convert. In Genesis chapter 12, it talks about Abraham left Egypt with much wealth. And we'll see here that Israel uh, uh, left Egypt with much wealth. Exodus chapter 12, 11 verse 2. So uh, uh, Abraham remembered how, how he too was blessed by the Egyptian Pharaoh. We'll see the parallel uh, with Sarah was taken and the, they were plagued. Pharaoh letting e Abraham go, but not without blessing him with silver, gold, and much, much cattle. So uh, the retelling of the story. So God is telling you and I. We too can break from our personal Egypt. The purpose of retelling the Passover story, Israel never believed, never believed that they will ever break out of slavery, out of the bondage of the enemy. They felt they were in a pit, a deep pit that was that had no way out. The enemy is trying to tell you and I, you know, we are, we are, you know, this is this is the end. You are, you are doomed. You, there's no hope in you. God is telling you and I that uh, he is the deliverer he will set us free let us not stop let us stop listening to the lies of the enemy let us believe the god of the impossible he is the god of the impossible so um, god is there to help us break the psychological life of the enemy that we are locked into a pit there is no hope for us with God, all things are possible. Amen. 
we have to make a decision to believe the word of God and put it into action. Stop listening to the lies of the enemy. He's the father of lies. So uh, what's interesting here is uh, uh, once the, uh, the, uh, the, the 10th plague, the Lord is telling Moses about the last plague. Afterwards, he will let you go. Verse 1, chapter 10, 11. And he shall let you go and you will surely trust trust you out altogether. So what's interesting here, um, God seems to divert instead of talking about you know, the plan for the 10th plague. He's talking about uh, verse 4. He's talking about the blessing. The blessing of wealth. Verse 2 speaks on, on the ears of people. Let them ask every man his neighbor, every woman their neighbor, jewels, silver, uh, jewels of gold. And then in verse 3, he begins to talk about them, how, how Moses was going to be very great in the land, in the sight of Pharaoh and his servant. And uh, how they will... Uh, they will uh, bow down before Moses. How Moses will be uh, in verse 5 and 6. He's talking about there's going to be a great cry. There's going to be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt. As there has been none like, like it nor shall there ever be. So we'll look at some insights here. The, the first one here he says there's going to be much wealth. So he's talking about uh, you know you, you're not just going to go out of there. You're going to go to your neighbors. Ask. Uh, that the children of Israel will be repaid for all the years they will be enslaved. So there's some insights from the Rumble here. The Egyptians' exile is the prototype of all exiles. What does that mean? So we're going to see, there's, again, there's some spiritual patterns here. The Exodus is a precursor of the final redemption. Look at that. that look, they're, they're saying that the, 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 the pattern of uh, the Exodus is going to be repeated in the final redemption. The dynamics contained in the name of the Parsha will be repeated at the end of the present exile as well. Now, it is interesting comment be, being made here because it is saying that the Exodus is a prototype for the final redemption. It is saying, so it is saying that uh, it's going to be repeated. So what is interesting about this comment is it's going to give us the main thing that is going to be repeated, which is, which we are going to see just prior to the final redemption, may it be in our lifetime, amen? That is, uh, the, uh, uh, from the apostolic letter, the, uh, the fullness of the Gentile has been, uh, until the fullness of the Gentile has been, has had many ideas of what this phrase means when Paul wrote it. Most people believe that whenever the, de the Gentiles cease to trample under through the temple and cease to be in position of power, to a certain extent, there is merit to that understanding. The fullness of the Gentiles, but based on the pattern, what the fullness of the Gentile actually mean is a more literal sense that is from the from the ancient writing that before Pharaoh was crushed, listen to this, before Pharaoh was crushed, God rede redeemed whatever good there was in Egypt, the non-Jews who wished to accompany the Jewish people were allowed to do so. And the Jews took with them an abundance of material wealth, not, wealth only uh, uh, when nothing was redeemed, had a redeeming value. Egypt was dealt a crushing blow. So what the ancient writers are saying is the ultimate price was the mixed multitudes that went with Egypt. We're going to talk about the mixed multitudes uh, later on. So the second point there is talking about how Moses is going to be great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servant. Look at that. So, so, uh, so, it to the point that they will the the, the, the Pharaoh's servants will be bowing to Moses. Look at the verse 8. And, and all these servants, they shall come unto me and bow down to me saying, Get thee out. And all the people that follow thee and after that, they will all will, will, will they will they go out. So, so, some insight. So, when God told Moses that everybody was supposed to collect wealth to Egypt from the, uh, the Israelites went collecting door to door, collecting the wealth of the Egyptian. But God but Moses did not do that. Moses went door to door, inviting the Egyptians 
the citizens of the world, the, the nations living there to join the Jewish nation. In other words, he went around seeking converts. Why? Because Moses' mind, and remember Moses here represents the Mashiach. He represents the Redeemer. In Moses' mind, the wealth of Egypt was not the silver and gold. The wealth of Egypt was the mixed multitudes. Uh, uh, the mixed multitudes that went in there. The fullness of the Gentiles. From his point of view, uh, when all the Gentiles were all willing to join the Jewish people and became converts to the covenant, when all of them were extracted from Egypt, then the redemption came. Which is... Uh, the reason why there was a large part, this, that is the reason why, uh, the large part of why Congregation Yeshua exists. We want to bring people to the truth about our Jewish Messiah, the true Torah-centered uh, uh, Judaism, centered on Yeshua, try to live the life Yeshua lived, not the life Constantine lived, not the life of the pagan Gentiles in Ephesus lived. We want to live the life Yeshua lived. The religion he uh, practiced, not the one that was created 300 years later. Another way is that according to the Bible, that the end time will be a manifestation when the nations convert, when the nation embrace the Torah, when the nations, according to Isaiah, embrace Sabbath. This is what is going to happen. Like I said, there's going to be a one world government, one world religion under Yeshua, the king, the king of Judah. You know, he's the king of Judah, the line of tribe of Judah. That's why all his subjects will be called Jews. We are going to be all Jews. So, but, you know, like I said, don't, don't be turned off by that. You know, a lot of uh, people say, oh, we're Christians. No, we are Jews because Yahu Yeshua is from the tribe of Yehuda. And finally, the third cry is there's going to be a great cry, the death of the firstborn, wailing cries will be heard in all Egypt. And God is putting judgment, judgment against the many families that wailed when their sons were taken from them. Remember when the Egyptian took their sons and threw them in the river. So there's judgment, you know, there's judgment that will come. There's judgment to come for the people who refuse, the people who refuse uh, God, the, tr the true living, the one true living God, will there will be judgment. So the tenth plague, the tenth plague is one of the, the most powerful, the most powerful false god is they, they worship the god of the ram. This is the ram represented by the son, the son of Ra. Uh, Israel is so is is to publicly remember. He, he said, "Don't boil it, but cook it in fire." So this is going to be a barbecue, a a a communal barbecue. Israel is to publicly slaughter the their god. Their rabbi. the Egyptians are not allowed to eat lamb. Why? Because they worship this this the the the, the sun Ra. Roast it outside, cooking it whole with its head. <coughs> excuse me, from within a fetal position. And since it is the 14th day of the month, you have a full moon for all Egypt to see that the true living God uh, prevails over all the false gods of the world. So interesting, how different is the, the 10th plague? In the previous nine, e Jews were, were immune from it. We're immune. In other words, in Goshen, if you lived in Goshen, the plagues did not affect you. Remember? Uh, so it says here, all of a sudden, on the 10th plague, the Jews were no longer immune. That is why it's called Passover. God makes Nisan the first month in their new year. Today we celebrate the religious new year. They said Rosh, Rosh Hashanah is the... Is the uh, civic new year when god created the world so uh he said he says here roast it whole with its head you shall leave it in uh, uh you shall eat it with your loins girded on your sh and your shoes on your feet you will eat it in haste not leave your home where you eat it and the blood shall be a token 
on your home. So they place the blood, right? So there's some insights here. Um, you know, you are to, um, um, when, the, when it says, when, when, they, when, the, when the angel of death sees the blood, the blood, he will pass over the place, shall not destroy you. Do not rush outside of your home. So there's some insights here about the roasted over fire together with its head, its legs, and its internal organs. So they're saying allegorically, the head, the legs, and the internal organs signifies the three dimension of our religion or Jewish, Jewish servants. The head is a study of the Torah. The legs is the limb of action. That is the active performance of the commandments. And the internal organs refers to our prayers, the inner life of our religious observance. It says all three of these areas, our intellect, study of the Torah, our actual performance of his commandments, and our prayer life, all of that must be totally uh, subjected or surrendered or put in the fire of, the, of his holiness. Wow. So God changed the new year. They changed the new year. God made there a new year. Why? Well, um, it says here, the month shall be to you be, the, to you the beginning of the month. So uh, Nisan or Abib um, is the first month. They became the first month. It's a command, Rosh Kodesh, given the first month. Why is this the case? There's multi-facets as to why it is. So the entire yearly cycle will be will be kept, is fixated on redemption. So God wanted the children of Israel to remember their birth and their redemption. Interesting because our weekly cycles keeps us focused on, sh on Shabbat. Every day it leads to, sh uh, to Shabbat. All days that come before the Shabbat, Shabbat are ultimately about Shabbat and entering into God's rest. Entering into heaven, that's what Shabbat means. You and it's literally like entering into heaven because that is ultimately our ultimate Shabbat is to be with God in heaven. So uh, the whole world, the whole whole life, day uh, day one, day two, day three, etc. Whatever we're doing in this life, all it's all about fulfilling our mission. But the, the but the reality is our is our focus is on serving God. Think about that. Our entire life, six days, represents our life in in uh, in in God. Our life in this world on the seventh day represents our uh, life with God. So there. So therefore, when we are living uh, our lives, our focus should be about the mission. Our mission. That is why when we desecrate the Sabbath, we work on the Sabbath, then our whole focus is, is off. We are no longer working for God and His mission and His calling, but we are working for our own life or worse, we're working for another master. But uh, I guess what I wanted to, sh to, sh to focus here is that when... That is why when the first Nisan, the month of the calendar, the answer is because God wants us to focus on our spiritual, not our natural freedom. The seventh month is the first month of the counting of the year. It is a very important month, obviously, for there are three holidays. But God wants us to be focused on our redemption uh, that needs to be number one so that the entire assembly of Israel saying on the 10th day of this month, so you shall take a lap. So we are, God wants us to focus on what he has done, the redemption and our purpose. Because uh, uh, like I said, you know, we, 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 we look forward to the Shabbat. We look forward for the rest. Uh, why? Because ultimately um, that is where we are heading. We're heading towards the kingdom of God and being uh, living with him for eternity. So, uh the end of the story, interesting, uh, Pharaoh um, lets Israel go. Israel leaves. You think that the next thing in the story is 
that Pharaoh will be chasing after them and God rescues them. But in Exodus chapter 13, that's interesting, God inserts uh, in the middle of the story as they left Egypt. So the Lord said to Moses, you shall therefore keep these ordinances in this season year after year. He's talking about the, the, the celebration of Pesach. So the, the celebration of Passover is not... Uh, it's it, God ordained it forever. So we as believers in Yeshua, we are to celebrate Pesach forever. And he says here, verse 11, all of a sudden he inserts the, the law of the firstborn. He says, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring you out of the land of, in, in, into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it to thee, that you shall set apart unto the Lord all that open the matrix. In other words, the, the womb, the very firstling that come out of the beast, uh, which has males, shall be the Lord's. And every firstling of the of the donkey of the ass shall you redeem with the lamb. And, the, and, and if you shall not redeem it, thou shalt break its neck. And all firstborn man among thy children shall you redeem. So... So here, the, the, God is introducing the law of the firstborn. The law of the firstborn. Why is that? Why? Because God is making Israel his firstborn, right? Israel is his firstborn, God said. So the Jewish people made a, tef, a, tef, tef, a tefillin that reminds them that they are uh, this tefillin, they wear it on the, the, the in the in their head and in their arm, left arm. They tie it. They bind the word of God. It reminds them that they are their firstborn. To love Him, He teaches. There is only one God. He teaches to love Him with all our heart. To teach, uh, teach your children the law of the firstborn. You are the one that will be introducing God. To the world so God is reminding us why he called us why Israel is the firstborn why we are the firstborn because why we are to take the Torah to the nations we are to teach the nations about this loving God whom we serve so um, I'm running out of time but we're going to look at quickly at the connection of Yeshua of course we're going to extensively study this uh, during the Passover Seder but uh, some interesting insights here the word sign there uh, the, the, the connection of Yeshua. Notice that the word sign, uh, is this is how you spell sign, and like Isaiah, uh, unto us, you, uh, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. It's the word ot, the Aleph, Vab, and Tav. And here, um, the Vab is missing. So uh, we learned that, notice that the word sign is misspelled. There's a missing Vab. Why is it left? Why is it left? The, the Aleph Tav, who is the Aleph Tav? Yeshua is the Aleph Tav. He said, I'm going to give you a sign. The sign is my my Yeshua. Yeshua is the Aleph Tav. And look at here. And whenever I see the blood, see that the word, the blood here is the uh, Ha Adam. This is Ha is the, Dam is, is blood. And notice that there is an Aleph Tav again. Again, uh, the blood, not only the blood, the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, the blood of the Lamb of God. Um, so, uh, notice that the word, in the next verse here, uh, you'll see here that uh, you, will, you will put the blood on the doorpost. And look at verse, Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. And you shall keep it on the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. It didn't say shall kill the lambs. Remember, every family of 10 is, uh, is equal to one lamb. So can you imagine um, if there were um, 600,000 families divided by 10, there's about uh, 60,000 lambs that were killed that day. Right? So... Notice that the whole assembly, the whole congregation of the Israel shall kill it. One singular, the, the word there, uh, uh, to him, one lamb. 
the whole assembly of congregation shall kill him, not them, pointing to Yeshua in the future. So again, look at look at the, here at the play of the words here. Like I said, the Aleph Tav is representing Yeshua. The Aleph Tav, Yeshua's blood on the doorpost. And there was the word sign here. The, the, the sign Aleph, Vav, and Tav means God. Aleph means God. Vav means nailed and Tav to the cross. God nailed to the cross. So you see here from these words alone, uh, you can see the connection to Yeshua. And here what's interesting is in Exodus chapter 12, verse 26, 27, I like to read it. It shall come to pass when your children will say to you, what does this service mean? What do you mean by this service? Then you shall say, it's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. Now, uh, in the next few Torah portion, when we talk about the sacrifice system, we learn in the sacrificial system, uh, when it was established, that nowhere does God say, that it is my sacrifice, but rather it is the people who are giving sacrifice. But this is the only verse where you will find where God says that the Passover is the sacrifice of the Lord. Again, talking about Yeshua, talking about Yeshua. Remember, Isaac was the type of the Messiah. Abraham commanded to take the life of his son, his only begotten son, the son that is in the image of the father. And we know that in the last minute, you know, um, Abra um, Isaac was replaced by, by the ram. So, some inside Ishmael uh, is the first son of, but 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 Isaac is the first son of Sarah. God was talking about the preeminence of the Messiah through Isaac as early as Abraham's time. The concept of the substitutional offering is engrafted in the Jewish people and reinforced in the sacrificial system. Later on, with God, with later on, it will be God's only begotten son. So in the in Yeshua in the in the Passover Seder, uh, we see here that Yeshua is talking about when he, he when he was not doing away with the Passover or were instituting a new sacrament called communion. He's pointing to his body, which is which is a sacrificial lamb, and the wine, which is his blood. So he's talking about. For I say to you, I will not drink. He's talking about the fourth cup. There's. Uh, Four cups in a uh, in a um, uh, Pesach Seder, and he says, "I will not drink this cup with you until I drink it, the cup of wine, until I in the kingdom of heaven shall come." And he took bread again, thanks, and broke it. So, uh, uh, so all all I wanted to point out here is that Yeshua never uh, uh, substituted Passover with any other. Uh, f festival. There's nothing wrong with communion, but it's not a substitute for the celebration of the Passover. So I have uh, a few minutes left. I'm going to talk about the mixed multitude because there's some interesting insights about the mixed multitude. So it says here that many people are, are aware of the mixed multitude. In uh, Exodus chapter 12, you see here that uh, when the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot beside children, they estimated in their writings there were about 3 million people, and a mixed multitude went also with them. So, so here's some insight. They're saying that most people, when they think of the mixed multitude, they think all of these Hebrews, Israelite Jews, again, these are synonymous terms, we all left Egypt, and among them was a big, huge strong of Jewish people that left Egypt. Among them was a small group known as the mixed multitude, who were non-Jews, who embraced God of Israel and left with them. There's two things that people don't realize. One is they think that they were the minority, a small group. But in fact, we learn that they were really a big group. Big group. Another thing they don't realize is that when... The mixed multitude went to Mount Sinai. They all converted. 
In fact, everybody who came out of Egypt, regardless of whether you were, a Jew, you were born Jewish or non-Jewish, everybody had to convert at Mount Sinai. Sages bring down that Mount Sinai, what happened at Mount Sinai is the main, is the mini, uh, is, is one of the main places where we receive the command for conversion. Why? Because we all enter the covenant together the same way. <clears throat> you cannot say because <coughs> I'm Jewish, I don't have to follow. Everybody had to go in the same way. Most people don't know when it comes to the Jewish people or the Hebrew people, there's a, there's a verse that talks about only 20% of them, of, of the 3 million were actually born Jews, meaning DNA Jews. So the majority of the people that left Egypt were the mixed multitude, were from the nations. And you can see that that's the pattern, you know, in the, in the end times, Remember, uh, the Jews only represent 12 million uh, about the population of Jewish people today. Maybe there's 12 to 15 million, and there's 7 billion. So you can see that uh, in the end, uh, you know, there will be more uh, um, non-DNA Jews who will be grafted in. That's why we are grafted, you know, um, that, uh, that will be grafted into the kingdom. Um, the same ha thing happened in Babylon, you know, when, uh, you know, in Babylon, when, um, when Cyrus com uh, commanded the children of Israel to return to, to Egypt, uh, to, to Israel, they said in Babylon, even, uh, even a great, a less number, one tenth of the Judeans prepared to leave for for Babylon, that means 90% remained in exile. Why? Because their life in Babylon was nice. They didn't want to go back to rebuild the temple, to go back to rebuild the wall. They didn't want to go back to repair the breaches. It was difficult. No one has done that before. That is a lot of hard work. So that's why my brothers and sisters, our walk in Yeshua, our faith in Yeshua, requires dedication it requires a lot of faith it requires a lot of enthusiasm lots of doing we are doers of the word not merely hearers amen so to conclude tonight the enemy wants to keep you in bondage even though yeshua already redeemed us we are his firstborn freeing from bondage so what why so we can serve him come and be free today through the shed blood of Yeshua. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you for my brothers and sisters. We thank you that you have set us free. Father, we thank you that you have not uh, given us the spirit of fear, the spirit of defeat. You know, we, it, it, there is always hope in you as we, as long as we are able to cry out to you to repent. Father, you, you hear us. Father, we I pray for my brothers and sisters that are caught in a lie that the enemy has put a bondage in them. Father, you have set us free through the blood of Yeshua. You have set us free so that we can move from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and your way to walk in your ways in our life. Father, you commanded us to, 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 uh, to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. Father, we thank you that you have gave, given us your Torah, your instructions on how we can live our lives so we can be pleasing to you. And Father, we pray for each and every brothers and sisters that are listening to this broadcast that you give us the faith to stand with you and to believe and to walk according to your ways, not according to our ways. We ask in Yeshua the Messiah. Everybody said, Amen. And I thank you today and I thank you for listening. And uh, again, uh, uh, please uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Pass the uh, share the message if you like the message. Uh, se uh, send the links to your family and your friends. The Lord told Moses to tell Aaron to bless and mark your people. And so are you blessed and marked today? <speaking in Hebrew> Ya 
shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Peace in the name of Yeshua, our Shah Shalom. Go in peace, my brothers and servant and sister and serve the Lord. Amen. Shabbat shalom.